I'm a female, and this occurred two years ago when I was 18. This takes place in Maine. Every summer, my family and I go up to camp in Dedham Ellsworth, Maine. It's about a three-hour drive from my house. The camp itself is about an hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life. My family owns it, and I've never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and my parents had gone to bed. I heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized that the dogs needed to go outside to do their business. So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my effing pincher, tiny dog, outside after turning on the porch light. I walked around to the front yard and I let the dogs off leash. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch and nothing else. So I tried to keep an eye on them. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a loon, wild bird, on the lake. When I looked back, I saw that the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they'd seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then that I realized I didn't see Alfie anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called for her a few times and heard some soft whimpering right where the dogs had been looking earlier. I took a couple steps in that direction and called for her again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between the rocks or gotten stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down, and it was Alfie. She'd been staying close to me the whole time. I just hadn't seen her. So naturally I was thinking, if Alfie is here, WTF is in the woods. I took another step forward and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing and were now on either side of me, looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there are lots of animals in Maine, and I figured the dogs knew better than I did, since I couldn't see anything. Right as I turned around, I heard the most absolutely bone-chilling thing I've ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard something someone call Alfie's name. It sounded almost as if it was trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted, and it almost seemed to wail. I freaked the F out and ran inside with the dogs. I have no idea what was out there in the woods. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, who is also family, lives at least a half mile in the opposite direction of where the thing was. What do you guys think? A few things to know. I share custody of my son with his father. It is 50-50. When my son was younger, I would wake him up at the crack of dawn to get him ready for daycare before I went into work. I've worked remotely for three years now and no longer have to wake up so early. I also love to talk to my kids about their memories. What's your happiest memory? What's your favorite memory with your brother? What's your earliest memory? As I think talking about their memories helps keep them alive in their minds, and I love to see the world through their eyes. A few months ago, when my son was six, he told me he remembered what it was like to be in my belly, that it was dark, wet, warm, and comforting. At the time, I didn't think much of it and just nodded and told him that I thought that was interesting. Fast forward to a month ago, I asked my now seven-year-old what his earliest memory was. I will do my best to describe what he described to me. He was three years old at the time. He was sleeping and woke up in a dark room. He didn't know where he was, but he stayed in his bed and visually observed the room. He described the room to me, which was spot on. We moved out of that house two years ago. He said at the time he didn't know where he was, but he wasn't scared. When the sun started coming up and brightening his room, I, his, his mother came in. He saw me and didn't know who I was, but again, was not scared. I asked him if he remembered his dad when he picked him up, and he said no. He didn't recognize his dad, his dad's house, or his own bedroom there. He said from that day he awoke in his room at my house, and going forward was when he began to learn. 
he said prior to the day he woke up. He couldn't see through his eyes. The way he describes it to me seems like the way you see in a dream. He struggled to explain this portion to me. He said it wasn't a scary feeling when he was finally able to see. At the time he was explaining this to me, his four-year-old sister was wandering around the house playing by herself, and he looked at her and said, I wonder if she remembers when she could see. I believe what he was describing to me was the moment his consciousness came to him. The moment he realized he was here on this earth, the way he explained it in such great detail makes me believe that this is an actual memory and not something he has made up. Does anyone have a similar experience? I had been working as a park ranger for over a decade, but nothing could have prepared me for the events that would unfold in the remote national park I patrolled. It was a typical day when I received a distress call from a group of hikers who had gone missing. They were well-equipped, experienced hikers, so I knew something was amiss. I immediately set out to find them. As I hiked through the dense forest, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my heart raced as I heard rustling in the bushes. I tried to tell myself it was just a wild animal, but deep down, I knew something was wrong. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. It was as if the forest was alive and it didn't want me there. I pressed on, determined to find the missing hikers, but the trail soon became difficult to follow. I could see signs of a struggle and my heart sank as I realized the hikers might be in grave danger. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a makeshift campsite. Tents were ripped open and backpacks were strewn about as if someone or something had ransacked the campsite. The hikers were nowhere to be found and I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to find them alive. As I searched the surrounding area, I heard strange noises coming from the trees. It sounded like a low growl, but it was unlike anything I had ever heard before. I drew my weapon prepared to defend myself, but the creature that emerged from the trees was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was a large humanoid creature with matted fur and razor-sharp claws. It was clearly intelligent, and as it bared its teeth at me, I knew it was hunting me. I fired my weapon, but the creature seemed unfazed. It charged toward me, and I knew I had to run. I ran as fast as I could, but the creature was right behind me. Its hot breath was on my neck, and I could feel its claws scraping against my skin. I stumbled, and it was all over. The creature pounced on me, and I knew I was going to die. But as the creature loomed over me, something strange happened. It stopped as if it had suddenly lost interest. It looked up towards the sky and let out a deafening roar before disappearing back into the forest. I was left shaken and confused, but I knew I had to find the missing hikers. I eventually found them, alive but traumatized. They told me stories of a creature that had been stalking them through the woods, but I knew they wouldn't be believed if they shared their experiences with the world. I made sure they got the medical attention they needed and escorted them back to civilization. But the memory of that creature still haunts me to this day. I've never seen anything like it before, and I hope I never have to encounter it again. The woods may be beautiful and serene, but they're also full of mysteries and dangers that we may never fully understand. This happened between 1986 and 1989. My uncles and cousins lived in Lamy, an area in the extreme south of Porto Alegre, Brazil. My uncle, now deceased, had a small Botico Brazilian restaurant in that region, and at that time the nearest neighbor was more than a kilometer away. Pasture and centenary trees predominated the landscape. To serve the region, there were two buses in the morning and two more in the early evening. At that time, there were rumors that a very large animal with the body of a man and the head of an animal had been seen nearby, and it was said that it attacked both animals and people. Several people claimed to have been attacked by this monster and luckily escaped. Others swore they had lost an ox or two to the creature. My aunt, very skeptical and dedicated to her children and day-to-day -day chores, 
did not like to pay attention to these inventions of the people, as she said. However, one day her disbelief was put to the test. She and one of my cousins were returning home by a bus, already in the dark of night. Less than ten people were on the bus, when in a certain part of the journey, something very large came out of the bush and hit the right side of the bus and returned to the bush. The crash caused the driver, perhaps out of fright, to lose control and brake sharply, stopping partially in a ditch. Despite the scare, there were no injuries, but people were very scared by that event. The driver got very irritated and left the bus mumbling and cursing, going to check the damage and at the same time calling for help. Being in the dark and still a long way from home, everyone stayed in their places. A few minutes after the driver left, everyone heard a strange grunt, which could not be from an animal or human being, according to the witnesses. People panicked and started crowding right next to the conductor's chair. Silence took over the people. Everyone was attentive to all external sounds when, without warning, a new knock was given on the same side of the bus. Everyone got up and ran to the other side. Some of the people began to cry and pray. One lady became out of control, and my aunt, very afraid, remained to protect her son. At that moment, the bus began to be violently shaken, as if something or something was shaking the vehicle from side to side. The dread grew as the bus rocked. It looked like it would be overturned at any moment. Looking through the windows, you could see a large figure outside, but you couldn't tell what it was. Without the slightest warning, everything stopped, and whatever was causing it started to make its way toward the front of the bus, where the door was open. At that moment, my aunt was so terrified that she wanted to die and not see what was attacking them. Even before the creature entered the bus, it was possible to smell a terrible, rotten, unbearable smell. Everyone fled to the back of the bus and huddled in a corner, which made them look like a single, shapeless mass of people huddled together. Those who had the courage to look swear to have seen a large, naked man with dark skin, a huge goat's head with huge horns and yellow eyes, who ran to the turnstile and stopped. He spent a few seconds straining and huffing angrily before turning around, getting off the bus and disappearing into the bushes. Unbridled crying took over people. People were in shock, totally terrified. A few long minutes passed when another bus pulled alongside this one. Another driver, who was called to help the damaged bus, was informed of what had happened and left to find the first driver, who had not yet returned. Luckily, he was walking along the side of the road, returning from the place he called the bus company. The military brigade was activated, and ambulances, experts, radio, and television came. The case was covered for a few months with newspaper articles and interviews with the victims. Search parties searched for the creature's tracks, but they were never found. Several theories were formulated about what would have attacked the bus, but nothing is proven. Apart from some dead animals which were attributed to the creature, nothing else happened. Nowadays, that region is populated and very different from the time when the events occurred, leaving the mystery of the creature that attacked the bus I lived in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and worked in Palmerton. I worked the late shift so I'd get out of work at 10 p.m. One night as I was heading home late because of overtime, I think it was about one a mile, I was driving down the road at the above coordinates. I saw two red dots of light from far away, but they seemed to be approaching my car very quickly. I slow down and suddenly these massive, battered, dragon-like leather wings come gliding with a single fat motion just over my car. It was so surreal and happened extremely quickly, but I didn't see its face or body detail. It was a new moon and there's only my headlights out there. I slammed on the brakes and get out, but it's just total darkness and this thing was black. I'd say its wingspan was about 10 or 11 feet. I've seen a condor before, and it was pretty much that size, just massive, but I could hear it flying away after I stopped and got out. There was just no moonlight, so I couldn't see it, but it sounded like when you spread a sheet out on a bed or throw a tarp over something. I've only told three people this story, but I figure I might as well post it somewhere so people can try to get a pic or something. It'd be cool to see it again. Edit.
Writing this post helped me consider any alternative explanations, and I'm willing to consider this as a possibility since it was so fast a sighting. It just seemed larger than five feet, but I didn't have anything nearby to gauge size with. The wings also could have looked leathery because of the reflection of my headlights on preened black vulture wings, which lacked the white flight feathers of turkey vultures. It would also explain why the red eyes were near the road and then flew above my car. I'm really not into hiking because I'm a very cautious person and I do my best to keep my friends out of trouble. But that's where my issue was. I ended up going with my friends along this trail so I could keep them from doing irrational, impulsive things. Anyhow, I come to a crossing where there was a rope bridge. Major no-no in my books, but my friends insisted upon crossing. I told them to pick up this small granite boulder and chuck it on the bridge to prove my point. They did it and it didn't collapse, so they started crossing. Unfortunately, I was the last one to cross, and when I was about three-fourths way across the bridge, it collapsed and I fell all about twenty-something feet. I was crazy lucky because I had offered to take most of my friend's sleeping bags and I had strapped them all over me to carry them comfortably because they're much stronger than I am. I landed and blacked out, but I managed with only five broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder as well as a small hairline fracture in my radius. The worst part for me, though, was all of the animal carcasses at the bottom of the crevice. I was just starting my vet studies at the time, and the mutilated bodies were so grim. They were the first things I saw when I woke up, and some of them were fresh. My legs landed on a dog, and there was a fawn a few meters away from my face. I was so sore and couldn't move because I was afraid that I might have been paralyzed, and all I could do was cry. My best friend heard me and shouted down, and I tried to scream to him. Thank God that rescue was called almost immediately, and... I was lifted out. It's safe to say that my friends now take my intuition as law. About a month ago, my boyfriend and I were on the couch of our home watching a scary movie around 9 p.m. He has two phones, his personal cell and his work phone. Once we finished the movie, I said I was going to get the shower going and wait for him to join me after he called his daughter to tell her good night. He used his personal phone to call her, leaving his work phone on the couch alongside his personal one once he hung up. He came to check on me in the shower and told me he would be in after he grabbed some clothes and a towel. However, after going back to the bedroom to grab those, he noticed that his personal phone was missing from the couch. He was only gone for about a minute from the living room to come to the bathroom. He spent another five minutes looking for it everywhere in the house, even tried calling it from his work phone several times before giving up and getting into the shower with me. About thirty minutes pass, he tells me about the incident, and we think nothing of it since I promised to help him find it after we get out. However, once we get out, we spent another five minutes tearing the house apart. Still nothing. He and I both called his personal phone several times, but we couldn't hear it anywhere. I finally have the idea to try and ping it, using the shared location services. That's when it shows up. Claiming to be in the neighbor's front yard, he thought I was joking with him until I showed him my screen. Neither of us had left the house, both the front door and the back door still remained locked from. When we got home earlier that day, I thought he was actually the one pranking me. He promised he wasn't. I stood in the doorway as he got a jacket on and went outside with his work phone using it as a flashlight and to call his personal phone. He looked for it for a while, but then I watched as he bent down, dug in our neighbor's bushes, and retrieved his flashing personal phone that lit up due to the incoming call. It had been raining and was very muddy, yet his phone was completely dry and seemingly untouched when he retrieved it. As he called it, the phone didn't make any sound, just buzzed. Yet when he double-checked that he kept the ringer on, thinking it got turned off, it was still on, as it should have been playing his ringtone, but it never did that entire time we looked for it. We cannot explain how it got outside in the span of about five minutes. Never rang even with the ringer on. 
was still dry after sitting in the rain or mud for about 40 minutes total, and how it ended up buried in the neighbor's bushes. Edit. I didn't want to make a separate post, so I, I, I thought I'd add on. Ever since this incident with the phone, more strange things have happened. Things have been knocked over in the middle of the night. I hear footsteps when I'm home alone, see things out of the corner of my eyes, and the scariest one yet. We have light fixtures that you click on and off, like flat buttons, not the switches. He and I were sitting on the couch in the living room when all of a sudden the lights in the dining room began to turn on and off. The creepy part was that the buttons were being clicked rapidly and loudly too. I would have chalked it up to faulty wiring if it was just the lights going crazy, but the buttons were physically being pressed and making noise too, as if someone was pressing it on and off very quickly. He said he has never experienced anything like this in this house before. It started happening after I moved in. After reading some comments, I'm beginning to think it's some sort of entity. It might be attached to me. I've had other paranormal experiences before, too. I was walking my dog, a black and white pity retriever mix, outside before putting him to bed around 11 p.m. It's very dark, as there's a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out from the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders on the woods. Usually there is nothing out of the ordinary, just woods and uh, normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes there's that weird, heavy feeling like something is watching you intently, but I honestly ignore it and we cut our walk short and head home since a brief scan of the area shows nothing is there. Tonight there was that heavy, watched feeling again, but when I scanned the woods there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, standing just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could be his twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring at it hard. Usually my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and wanted to get away, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home without looking back but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, it felt like the safe thing to do. I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows. I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? Google was not much help. We live in North Georgia at the base of the Appalachians, but I didn't grow up here, so I'm not sure of local folklore for the most part. I didn't hear this, but my mother did. My mother's sister and I had taken a trip to Oregon to see my dad in the summer of 2002. He lives in Parkdale, Hood River, Oregon, and there is a lot of forested areas around his place. The three of us were in the camper one night, very tired from driving. My mother was, for some reason, awake and laying in the bed. About three in the morning, my dad's peacocks and ducks and gucks and guinea hens started freaking out and making loud noises. My mom wondered why they were doing this. She figured there was a fox or something in the hen house. But then everything became quiet, and in the not too far distance she heard this yelling and screaming. She laid in the bed, listening for a few minutes, and every animal she knew went through her head. She used to work in a zoo, so she knows quite about, about animals. Every animal that went through her head had no sound like that. The screaming went on for a little bit and then sounded further and further off. She finally fell asleep and told me about it when I woke up that morning. I had chills going down my back because a few years before that night I used to come to my dad's every summer. One night I was in a dead sleep and my dad's dog started growling and barking. He slept in a kennel right next to me. And after my mom told me about that night, I thought of the dog barking. What if Bigfoot was looking at me? 
through the window. Just nights before my mother heard this, we had been driving up into Oregon. I was driving and my younger sister was in the passenger seat. Both of us saw a huge black figure walk across the road just at the end of our headlights. When we passed it, I looked at my sister just to make sure she saw it too. Moments later, my mother made me stop and get out so she could drive. I was of course afraid to do this for the nine-foot man that just walked across the road. I lived in New York around the time that Ralph Bucky Phillips was on the run. He was a fugitive who had killed at least one police officer. At any rate, I was out for a hike near my old farmhouse and came across a recently vacated campsite. It still had recently purchased canned goods, tent, and sleeping bag, though nobody was around. I get stupidly fearless when I should know better sometimes and peered into the tent, but there was nobody around as far as I could see. I got the creep strongly and headed back, not going directly home, zigzagging in case I was being followed. Whether or not it was him, odds are it was probably just some squatter who was hiding from me themselves, not wanting to get caught on private land. It was still horrifying to have it slowly dawn on me that I was alone in what was basically somebody's home, and they could do whatever they wanted to about that. Another time, different place. My friend and I were exploring some disused and abandoned underground mines in our state. The way it is set up, you have to pass through a main room when you first go in. It is sort of open to the outside, but also sheltered. If that makes sense, it branches out into several veins that go underground and become pitch black. Totally zero percent visibility in there without a flashlight. So we chose the usual route. We had been in there several times already, and had a usual route, lull, and explored for a few hours. It became time to head back. We reached the main room, and there is a fresh, large pile of human feces right in our path to get out. It was most definitely not there when we entered, and we remained close together at all times, so I knew that my friend hadn't done the shit. We had to really stretch to avoid stepping in it. We managed to avoid it totally, but how disgusting. And as we passed the stone hallway that led to another branch of the mine, we saw some sort of light way down there where it opens into a larger, totally black room. My guess is that we interrupted a squatter who did not want to be seen, but also did not want to just allow some twenty-something weirdos to traipse all around their territory, and they took the shit to make a statement. We actually called out, hey, if someone hears this and is staying here, we meant no harm and didn't do anything to destroy your home because we are considerate like that. During 1999, I worked briefly as a vacuum cleaner salesman. Yes, the job was as terrible as it sounds. Now, which required very late nights, as I was often at customers' homes till around 9 p.m., before having to go back to the head office to check out, then drive back home, often not arriving home until 12, 1 a.m. I was working late this one particular night and was on the home stretch around 10 minutes from home when my old crappy cheap Ford Fiesta started to overheat. I knew the car wouldn't make it home and had no choice other than to pull into a lay-by on top of the big, dark, deserted mountain next to my town. My hometown is literally the last town, before there are just mountain and forest for countless miles. As I pulled into the mountain parking area with steam pouring my engine, this is 100% true, by the way, a white humanoid figure, Obviously surprised that a car was pulling into a deserted parking space in the middle of the night, ran directly front of my headlights as it sprinted from the edge of the clear side of the parking area and into the forest on the other side. It had no clothes, features, genitals, and hair, etc. Just a white figure with two arms and two legs that appeared almost luminous and reflective in my lights. To say I shit myself is a bit of an understatement. My eyes popped out of my sockets when it ran in front of me, but then I realized that I was stuck in a dead car in a deserted mountain lay by in the middle of the night with no mobile phone signal. 
as this was back in the days when mobile phones were just starting to become popular, but large chunks of the country were missing from network coverage. I had no choice but to sit there for around an hour until my car cooled down as it gave up the ghost pretty much the second I pulled in. So I sat in my car, alone, staring directly into the forest where the thing I saw had run. No weapon, no way to contact anyway to let them know where I was and no passing traffic to possibly flag down. During my wait in the car, I obviously started to wonder what I had seen. I knew for a fact that I had actually seen something, and it was not a trick of the light. That much was clear. I discounted sheep, horses, foxes, or any other animal that populated the Welsh mountains, as I was certain, in a two-legged humanoid creature shape, with roughly human head, body, arms, and legs proportions. The obvious answer would have been that it was some very strange man who, for some reason, was wearing a white entire body stocking. Think Charlie's Green Man, and it's always sunny, but since we were miles away from the nearest home, and I was the only car around, it's highly unlikely that someone would have spent hours walking through thick forests just to hang out at a parking area in the middle of a forest wearing a unitar. Since I could rule out possible animals or humans, I had to consider the alternative, which isn't a nice thing to think about, when you are stuck in a broken-down car with this creature very possibly still outside. I didn't think it was aliens, as it was too tall compared to the classic look, while any type of apparition or ghost doesn't tend to run away from people when surprised. I'm not sure if there is some kind of Welsh version of a Wendigo, but if I had to categorize the encounter, this would be my number one choice. There was always talk of satanic rituals and witches practicing in the forest when I was a kid, and also of illegal bare-knuckle fights where people had been killed and buried there to cover up the crime, but I didn't think much of it at the time, and always wrote it off to superstition and rumor. But now I'm not so sure. Eventually, my car cooled down enough for me to limp back home. No one really believed me when I told them what I saw and are adamant that it was a sheep, but to this day I will swear that the creature I encountered was something different. I have been in the forest many times since camping, biking, and hiking, and have never seen anything like that again. But whenever I go there, I am always aware of the possible presence of the goatman. I'd been hiking in Wikiwa State Park since it's literally across the street from my house. I was somewhere on the Orange Trail. I really hadn't seen anyone cause it was chilly. I started hearing laughter from the scrub about 20 yards to my left. It made me a bit nervous considering there was nobody to make the noise, but I continued on. Probably two more minutes pass and I hear it again, this time a bit closer. I picked up the pace. Less than a minute later I heard it for a third time followed by substantial movement coming out of the brush behind me. I didn't look, I just ran. I ended up sucking wind, maybe half a mile down the trail. I couldn't keep going. I ended up facing the direction of the creepy noises and taking a knee to rest. As I was turning back around to continue my hike out, I found a packet containing three sharp knives. I shut myself. Everything after that is a blur. I told a ranger at the front as I left. It didn't seem like an urgent matter to them, so I just left it. I have no idea what it was, or what it could have been. I just know I didn't want any part of it. I have one other creepy story from when I was a kid. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.